To colonists living in America in the 17th century, few things were more important to their survival than pumpkins. As one poem from the 1630s put it, Instead of pottage and puddings and custards and pies, our pumpkins and parsnips are common supplies. We have pumpkins at morning and pumpkins at noon. If it was not for pumpkin, we should be undone. And as I wish not to be undone, I'm making one of America's first recipes for pumpkin pie from 1796. So thank you to NordVPN for sponsoring this video as we make America's first pumpkin pie, this time on Tasting History. Today's recipe comes from American Cookery by Amelia Simmons, which was published in Hartford, Connecticut in 1796. It's often considered the first cookbook by an American published in the relatively new United States of America, and it has some of the earliest recipes for pumpkin pie, especially that custardy pumpkin pie that we know and love today. But her recipes are still rather different than the modern pumpkin pie. She actually has two recipes, but the one I'm making today simply calls for one quart of milk, one pint pumpkin, four eggs, molasses, allspice, and ginger in a crust. Bake one hour. So a few differences between this and the modern pumpkin pie. First of all, she calls it pumpkin. And you'll find that early on, there are a lot of ways to spell the word pumpkin, none of which is actually pumpkin. The French spelled it pompon, which came from medieval French, and then the English turned it into pompion or pumpion. And both of those words could really refer to all manner of squash or even melons sometimes. It wasn't until later that they added the K to make pumpkin, kin being a suffix that could be used to denote a similarity between things. Another theory is that the K came from the Massachusetts language as their word for this food was popokin. Either way, the spelling pumpkin is really the last one to come around, and I'm curious if in a couple hundred years there'll be even a different way to spell it. The second major difference between this and a modern pie is that she sweetens it not with sugar, but with molasses. So it will be far less sweet than we're used to. But I've decided to make it anyway because this is tasting history and having something that tastes a little bit different is, is part of the fun. Another thing that I find fun is watching British TV shows even though they haven't come out here in the US. And for that, I need a little help from today's sponsor, NordVPN. Yes, among other things, Nord lets me watch all sorts of content from all over the globe, even if it is not available where I actually am. They can place my location pretty much anywhere on the globe, so I have access to whatever I want. This feature actually came in really handy last month when I was in Europe, because as one does on vacation, I was researching this very episode, Nerd Alert, and it turns out that a lot of the, the resources that I use day to day weren't available when I was in Europe. It's a lot of libraries and museum websites, and they just, I, I couldn't get them. I guess 17th century journal entries on pumpkins are just too scandalous for the EU. But with NordVPN, I was able to change my location back to the US so I could browse with impunity. I've also been using NordVPN to help me keep track of all of my passwords. With NordPass, they'll help you securely store all of your passwords so you'll never have to hit forgot password again. So visit my link nordvpn.com slash maxmiller and get extra subscription time and a huge discount. You can try it risk-free with a 30-day money-back guarantee. That's nordvpn.com slash maxmiller, and thank you again to NordVPN for supporting educational content, specifically historical cooking content here on YouTube. And for this historical cooking content, what you'll need is one quart or one liter of whole milk, four eggs, a half cup or 190 grams of molasses, one and a half teaspoons of allspice, and two teaspoons of ginger, and two cups or 450 grams of pumpkin. I'm using a sugar pumpkin because it is, as the name would suggest a little bit sweeter than others, but really any squash is going to work. To make life easier, you can also use canned pumpkin, and this is typically Dickinson pumpkin. But if you are going to use a whole pumpkin, then you have a few options on how to cook it. She says in one of the recipes that it can be stewed and strained. And that makes me think she never actually tried it, because if you stew and strain it, one, it becomes very watery, and two, it loses all of its flavor, and pumpkin doesn't have a very strong flavor as it is, 
So instead, I would do as most recipes from this time suggest and roast it. So cut it in half and scoop out all of the insides. Then set it on a lined baking sheet and bake it at 350 degrees Fahrenheit, 175 Celsius for one hour. And as soon as it's done, take it out and remove the skin while it's still hot. It should come off very easily in strips. Then let it cool just a bit before mashing it up as smooth as you can. And if you want to, you can pass it through a strainer to get even a nicer, smoother puree. Then to the pumpkin, you're going to add the eggs, which should be well beaten. Then the molasses, which should be the sweetest molasses that you can find. There are multiple kinds. You don't want sulfured or blackstrap molasses. It's gonna just be too bitter. Then add some of the milk and start to whisk the ingredients together. And then add in the allspice and ginger and the rest of the milk and whisk until everything is well combined. This is so much more liquidy than a modern filling, so I'm gonna guess that it's gonna be quite uh, lighter as well. Now, she says to put it into a crust, and you can just use your favorite pie crust, that's fine, but in the first recipe for, for the pumpkin pie, she says to use either recipe three or seven, which she has several paste recipes in there. I am going to be using number three because it sounds wonderfully rich. It says to any quantity of flour, rub in three fourths of its weight of butter, 12 eggs to a peck, rub in one third or half, and roll in the rest. To make this crust, what you'll need is one pound or 450 grams of flour, three fourths of a pound of butter, and two eggs. Rub the butter into the flour until you get a sort of breadcrumb consistency, and then add in the egg. Mix in the egg until you have something like a pie dough should be. Then roll it out and line a deep pie pan. And you do want the deepest pan that you can find because it is a lot of filling, or you can make two regular sized pies as well. Either one will work. Whichever you choose, give the crust a crimp, and then you'll need to blind bake it if you want any chance of this pastry actually getting cooked. So line the crust with some foil and add in some pie weights, and then bake this for 15 minutes at 350 degrees Fahrenheit. Take it out, remove the weights, and return it to the oven and bake for another 15 or 20 minutes, or until all the crust is pretty much baked. You can also use a pie shield, which is this thing that goes around the crust. If the crust starts to brown too much, it has saved many a crust for me. Then let the crust cool and start ladling in the filling. I filled it about three quarters of the way full, then put it in the oven and ladled the rest afterward, because moving this with all the liquid, you're gonna make a huge mess. Uh, so get it mostly full, put it in the oven, and then ladle in that final amount. Once it's in the oven, you're gonna bake it at 350 degrees Fahrenheit for about 75 to 80 minutes, or until there's just a slight wobble in the middle. And while it bakes, do hit the like button as I tell you how this iconic pumpkin pie became a staple of American cookery. America's love affair with pumpkins goes back long before America was even a thing. Different squashes were staples of the cuisine of numerous indigenous people from North, Central, and South America. So it's no wonder that when Europeans did come to the New World, pumpkins were among the first foods they encountered. The country aboundeth naturally with store of good roots of great variety and good to eat. Here are also store of pumpkins, cowcumbers, and other things of that nature which I know not. When in 1634, a Dutch surgeon and his compatriots were on the verge of starvation in upstate New York, it was the pumpkin brought to them by indigenous people of the area that saved them. December 30th, a woman came to meet us, bringing us baked pumpkins to eat. We ate heartily of pumpkins, beans, and venison, so that we were not hungry, but were treated as well as is possible in their land. This dependence on pumpkins runs through many stories from this early period of American history, mainly because Europeans often arrived woefully ignorant of how to grow their European crops in this new land. For example, in 1654, Edward Johnson wrote a history of the first English settlers of Massachusetts. In it, he says that when the English arrived in what they would call Concord, Massachusetts in 1635, the want of English grain, wheat, barley, and rye proved a sore affliction to some stomachs who could not live upon Indian bread and water. Instead of apples and pears, they had pumpkins and squashes of divers kinds. That is, many new varieties of pumpkin and squash. And exactly what they're talking about is unclear, because as I said, at this time, many people used the term pumpkin or, or pumpkin to 
mean all sorts of different squashes and even melons. And so you get terrible definitions like this one from 1629, which says that a pumpkin is a fruit which is very great, sometimes of the bigness of a man's body, and oftentimes less, in some ribbed or bunched, in other plained, and either long or round, either green or yellow or gray, as nature listeth to show herself. My favorite thing about this is that the author, John Parkinson, realizes about halfway through that his description is so vague as to make it pretty much useless as a definition. For it is but waste time to recite all the forms and colors may be observed in them. What most descriptions of the time don't include is the fact that pumpkins are often orange. Rather, the great round pumpkin is oftentimes of a greener color with a harder bark. Or the common pumpkin is either long, flat, round, or pyramidal, having a hard rind of a green or dark green color spotted with white. First off, I want to see what a pyramidal pumpkin looks like. Is it pyramidal? Pyramidal? A pyramid-shaped pumpkin. Uh, what is he talking about? Also, even though the fact that the outside of these pumpkins tended to be white or green, their pulp is as yellow as saffron, which makes me think that any of them could work in a pie like the one that is in my oven right now. And these pumpkins, regardless of their color, were perfect for the early settlers because they were numerous and they grew in great quantities. When they were planted in Virginia in 1615, pumpkins propagated in such abundance that a hundred were frequently observed to spring from one seed. And they made the pumpkin into all sorts of dishes, including pottages, soups, puddings, or something that in 1671 was described as the ancient New England standing dish. They would take a pumpkin and stew it in water for an entire day, and then they would mix it with butter and a little vinegar, with some spice and ginger, etc., which makes it tart like an apple. It provokes urine extremely and is very windy. So it made you have to pee and it made you gassy. How lovely. Now, even though they were using pumpkins in all sorts of dishes, it doesn't seem that the colonists were entirely won over by the food just yet. In Massachusetts, for example, by 1642, they had anglified the countryside so that instead of relying on fish and beans for their protein, they had beef and pork and mutton available. And for desserts, they had apples, pears, and quince tarts instead of their former pumpkin pies. And around this period, when their European foods had finally become available in the New World, pumpkin's reputation became a bit tarnished. Now, in England and the colonies, it didn't go away completely, but it became thought of as a food that you ate because you had to, because you didn't have access to something else or you couldn't afford something else. Why eat what they would often call the insipid flavored pumpkin when you could have a sweet pear or apple for two or three times the price. The ingredient does appear in a handful of cookbooks, like The Queen-like Closet by Hannah Woolley in 1670, which is the source that I used when I made my pumpkin pie a few years ago. But really, it never became a staple of the English kitchen, or at least it wouldn't for quite some time. The southern colonies also turned up their nose at pumpkins as something that was less than ideal to eat. Really, it was only in New England that the pumpkin continued to thrive and it did have its proponents. Like in 1654, when Edward Johnson wrote, let no man make a jest at pumpkins, for with this fruit the Lord was pleased to feed his people to their good content. And instead of seeing those early settlers' reliance on pumpkins as something to be ashamed of, they began to see it as a bit of a badge of honor. It was hearkening back to a simpler time when there were just a handful of colonists struggling to survive. The times wherein old Pompeian was a saint, when man's fared hardly yet without complaint, on vilest cates the dainty Indian maize was eat with clamp shells out of wooden trays. These golden times, too fortunate to hold, were quickly find a way for love of gold. New Englanders clung to their beloved pumpkins, and by the 18th century, the word had actually become synonymous with the people, specifically those around Boston. Pumpkin, a man or woman of Boston in America, from the number of pumpkins raised and eaten by the people of that country. And the area around Boston became known to some as Pumpkinshire. 
And they were making all sorts of foods with these pumpkins, from pumpkin soups and stews to pumpkin pudding, pumpkin ale, and pumpkin porridge being as much in esteem with New England saints as jelly broth with Old England sinners. There was even a recipe from 1770, albeit from Virginia, to make pumpkin chips. It called for thinly shaved pieces of pumpkin mixed with orange peel that were then boiled in a syrup of orange juice and sugar. It actually sounds really good and maybe it'll be something that I need to try for Thanksgiving. It was also around this time that pumpkin pie became associated with the early Thanksgivings. In 1779, Congress declared that it be recommended to the several states to appoint Thursday, the ninth day of December next, to be a day of public and solemn thanksgiving to Almighty God for his mercies. And to celebrate that Thanksgiving, the 18-year-old Juliana Smith of Connecticut enjoyed a feast, which she wrote to her dear cousin Betsy. And she says that the pumpkin pies, apple tarts, and big Indian puddings lacked for nothing, save appetite by the time we had got round to them. We did not rise from the table until it was quite dark, and then when the dishes had been cleared away, we all got round the fire as close as we could, and cracked nuts, and sang songs, and told stories. Sounds very cozy and, frankly, quite familiar to many of our Thanksgiving traditions today. Namely, the fact that by the time dessert rolls around, I am usually so stuffed that I have to wait to eat until the next day, or at least a couple hours where I can lie down on the couch like an exhausted manatee. And speaking of Thanksgivings, three years ago, I, when I first started the channel, pretty much, I made the pumpkin pie from, from 1670. and. So many people ended up making that pie for Thanksgiving and having it on their holiday tables, and they shared pictures with me. And that has to be one of my favorite memories of the last three and a half years working on this channel. Just kind of being able to be part of other people's holidays. It was, it was so special. So this year, if you make this pie or any of the pumpkin desserts or the pecan pie that doesn't have corn syrup in it, um, please share pictures either on Instagram or Reddit or Facebook or Twitter uh, and, and tag me because I really, really enjoy that. Though if you are going to make this pumpkin pie, I better show you how to finish baking it. Because instead of taking it right out of the oven when it's fully baked, just turn off the oven and leave it in there. And you can wedge the door open with just a wooden spoon because you want it to cool down very, very slowly, that's going to help it not crack. You know how sometimes pumpkin pies will crack across the top? Ruined. This will help it not crack. And once it's completely cool, you can slice it up. And here we are, a slice of the first American pumpkin pie. I mean, it's quite beautiful. And actually, I was a little worried that because it was so liquidy that it was just gonna melt, but um, it didn't. It's it's definitely not as firm as a modern pumpkin pie, but it holds together. Mmm. That's really good. So you're really getting the spice. So much more than the sweetness, because there ain't no sugar in it. You're getting the sweetness only from the molasses. But it's killed all the bitterness of the molasses. That's really, really good. And if you don't like a sweet, sweet pumpkin pie, this is the way to go. The texture is wonderful. It is firm, but it's so smooth. It, it's more like a firm pudding. Um, if you do want it sweeter, I would just add in maybe a half cup, uh, a, third, uh, a half cup of brown sugar when you're mixing everything together, and that will sweeten it up. I don't think it's necessary. Mm. So I'm pretty sure that this is going to end up becoming a staple of my holiday season. I think my parents are going to like this because it's not as sweet. Um, yeah, th th this is going to hang around till Christmas. Another thing that is hanging around till Christmas is the Bayou Tapestry Merry Christmas sweater that I did last year. I'm bringing it back because I didn't put it out until way too late, so a lot of people didn't get it. So I'll put a link in the description where you can get that if you want to show off your love of Christmas and the Norman invasion. And I will see you next time on Tasting History. So good. So smooth. Mm.